so finally, uh, this week we have uh, Sarah Bartley from Queen Mary University of London. Um, and we're, we're doing fine for time, so um, I'll give you a shout out in three minutes. Great. Great. This, this is why I might email Naomi about the project she's working on, not just because I'm quite threatening. Uh, also, <laughs> um, I've got my juice drink because I've got a bit of a cough, so I might need to attend to my juicy at some point. Possibly. Uh, okay, so yeah, this is my paper, Hard Labour and Punitive Welfare are set aside in the unemployed body at work. And what I argue is welfare provision in the UK has become a kind of necropolitics. As Francis Ryan wrote in The Guardian, death has become a part of Britain's benefit system. That's not hyperbole, but the reality that the stress caused by austerity has led us to. And I find her statement bleakly, bleakly ac accurate, and this paper urges are organisations engaging in employability rhetoric to contribute to the reframing of the unemployed body? In, 2000, in 2008, post-global economic crisis, unemployment has become hyper-visible. Persistent, persistent focal points are the young unemployed and non-working adults claiming sickness benefits. In this paper, I examine the specific experience of these two groups and propose the corporeal body of the unemployed citizen is itself a site of contest. My conceptualization builds on Judith Butler's notion of disposable or vulnerable bodies, applying it here to unemployed persons, and examines art practices seeking to intervene in this acute vulnerability through their representation of those bodies. I will then utilize Harry Nolan's concept of embodied gesturing as a mode of cultural resistance to focus on the politics of the kinesthetic experience of unemployed bodies in states of labor. Finally, in the context of un exploitative labour practices that Reese was talking about this morning, I will draw on Nicholas Rideout's an analysis of delegation in contemporary performance to consider the implications of unpaid labourers working alongside professional performers to produce creative work. I will discuss these concepts in relation to two participatory artworks, both of which engage the young unemployed and the non-working sick, uh, respectively. So the first is Tangled Feats, uh, 2013 production One Million, which was a vast outdoor performance spectacle fusing drama, live music, poetry, dance and acrobatics. It was performed at Greenwich and Dauphin's International Festival by a combination of 80 young unemployed participants drawn from the locality and 10 professional performers. It addressed the announcement that youth unemployment in the UK had reached one million. Alongside this, I will discuss Mindful, which was a collaboration between Helix Arts and Timeside Mind for employment support allowance claimants. The 2013 project began with participants sharing their experiences of the work capability assessment in a number of workshops using various art forms. The group then produced the short film for I'm Here for Mental Health, outlining the highly stressful work capability assessment process. I propose that both projects power powerfully aestheticize the unemployed body to challenge the growing precarity of welfare claimants in contemporary Britain. In doing so, they demonstrate the potential in participatory performance to productively reconceive the corporality of unemployed participants. But how? Um, so the precarious body of unemployed citizen. There is a tension between inactivity, potential labour power, and exploitation of that power in a consideration of the unemployed body. However, I want to argue that the contemporary contestation of these bodies in the UK context goes beyond labouring and non-labouring potential and is enacted in the categorisation of unemployed bodies through the assessment of corporeal and cognitive ability. This is most evident in the distinction between unemployed uh, claimants receiving job seekers allowance, or GSA, and those who are too ill to work in receipt of employment support allowance, ESA. Um, flashback, there's a historical relationship between politics and the categorization of these sick or non-sick bodies. Um, during the late days, the wonderful Margaret Thatcher's government colluded with the GPs, colluded with GPs to direct claimants onto invalidity benefit, now ESA, rather than unemployment benefit, in order to maintain a perceived lower level of unemployment despite the collapse of heavy industries. So this conflation of unemployment and unfitness serves to individualise worklessness to the claimant and obscures, both statistically and ideolo ideologically, 
broader system systemic failings. It performs an erasure of citizens that makes their bodies more disposable. So this literal doctoring of figures has been turned by Christina Beatty, the largest distortion to unemployment data in the UK. Invalidity benefit claims have consistently ri risen over the last 30 years as successive governments failed to challenge the precedents set by the Tory leadership in the 1980s. Facing this legacy of sickness claims, the current Conservative government have adopted a similar strategic aim to that of the 1980s in reducing the perceived level of claimants. But this time they've inverted the process, so by diverting those on ESA back onto JSA. The classification of recipients of ESA through the work capability assessment has thus become a politicised event. Government figures, hey, uh, government figures reluctantly released in August under a Freedom of Information application reveal that between December 2011 and February 2014, 2,380 people had died within a year of being declared fit for work. Over the same period, 7,200 died within a year of being allocated to the work-related activity group. A categorisation that recognises you're not able to work, but requires you still to attend meetings with your job centre advisor, partake in work programme activities, and leaves your claims susceptible to sanctions, whilst also financially reducing your benefits. Great. Um, in such a climate, to conceive the bodies of unemployed citizens through Butler's lens of vulnerability in relation to state policy is, particular per is particularly pertinent. And on the 24th of September 2013, six-year-old Michael O'Sullivan commits suicide. This is the first death to be recorded by the coroner's office as a direct result of being declared fit for work. His daughter, Anne Marie O'Sullivan, stated, if they continue to assess people the way they assess dad, we will continue to lose lives. It is here we see, pain, it was here we see painfully clearly how welfare provision and the struggle for the correct corporeal categorization among the unemployed is directly linked to a necropolitical conception of the state. The precarity of the unemployed body has never been more acute. So, experiencing alternatives and witnessing potential. The Participatory Arts Project demands the creative production of participants, but what are the implications of engaging the labour of those explicitly identified as unproductive? When applied to the unemployed participant, this creation and contribution, this productivity, has the potential to become a highly rad radical endeavour. Framed as creative producers, participants in One Million and Volunteers for Mental Health challenge the conditioning they have been subject to as unemployed citizens through embodied responses, an instance of agency which Carrie Nolan suggests can be accessed through embodied gestures. And I just want to note here, my engagement with Carrie Noland came about through reading about it in Jenny Hughes and Simon Parry's wonderful introduction to their superb uh, special issue, Contemporary Theatre Review, which I would encourage everyone to read. Um, because, yeah, it's wonderful. It's about protest and gesture and theatricality. And, yeah, so that's how I find Carrie Noland. Um, back to her. Noland's theory diverges from that of Butler's in its privileging of kinesthetic experience. The, body is the bodily is distinct from the discursive act. This privileging of the body gives a valuable perspective to my analysis of corporeal resistance. As Nolan comments, kinesthetic experience produced by acts of embodied gesturing places pressure on the conditioning a body receives, encouraging variations in performance that account for larger innovations in cultural practice that, that cannot otherwise be explained. So in one million, participants felt their bodies move in a resistant or even deviant manner to the hegemony. Noland argues that this experience of kinesthesia encourages exper experimentation and produces agency. I therefore propose that the curious inversion evident in this kind of participatory art, the experience of, part of participants in kinesthetically engaging with the world in a manner irregular to their norm, provides an opportunity to reorientate their bodies in relation to labour. And notably, as a kind of aside, there was a reticence from Greenwich Council to commission the project. So soon after the 2011 riots, putting young bodies in a space together to provoke issues of unemployment held a threat of protest, dissent and revolt. In actuality, the agentic space it opened 
serve to aestheticize the product productivity of young bodies. So both One Million and But I'm Here for Mental Health represented the body of the unemployed in public space. One Million was a spectacle, a free outdoor performance by a cast of 90 young people, in which they demonstrated their dynamism as creatives, but also as potential employees. The show primarily took place on these built scaffolds, uh, which allowed participants to climb, swing, and slide their way across the performance space. In conversation with artistic director of Tangled Feet, Nathan Curry, he commented on the ability of the performance to contest the imagery of lethargic youths. When you see someone dance and you see someone perform, you see their potential, you think, oh, they've got loads of movement, and look, look how great they are, look, they can. It's not only about witnessing them full stop, but witnessing their potential. They are creative and vibrant and exciting opportunities. So one thing is witnessing them standing there and being present. The other is witnessing what they can do. <coughs> the <ne> <coughs> I'm gonna have my juice drink. Mm. The necessity to be witnessed recurs in discourse around unemployment and arts with the unemployed. Participatory practice allows people, often reduced to statistics, to be witnessed in a bodily register. As Curry notes, one million develops that beyond a simple seeing into a seeing of potential. Works like one million defy the framing of the young in social policy. At a time when Chancellor George Osborne announced that 16 to 24 year olds will not be receiving a new national living wage, but will remain on basic minimum wage. MP Matthew Hancock recently defended the move by claiming that young workers were not productive enough to warrant the higher wage. So re-engaging with necropolitics, the exclusion of the young from the living wage, linguistically conceives them as less than alive due to their conceptually depreciated labour power. Seeing these bodies so often defined by their inactivity, performing that very labour power problematises the manner in which we categorise them. As Butler notes in her call to reconfigure discourses on vulnerability as practices of resistance, there is a plural and performative bodily resistance at work that shows bodies being acted upon by economic and social policies that are decimating livelihoods. But these bodies, in demonstrating this precarity, are also resisting those very powers. By gathering bodies together and overtly performing their precarity in public space, one million highlights the oppression and resistance of the young. It is not that they are incapable, unwilling, or unproductive, it is that unequal social policy and the fractured labour market have failed them. <coughs> Contrastingly, Helix's But I'm Here for Mental Health removed the actual bodies of participants involved in the project, replacing them with those of actors. The fear of recognition and retribution left the participants and facilitators unable to conceive of this vulnerable of vulnerability of identifiable bodies as a mode of resistance. The absence then of these bodies haunts the film, signifying the participants' experience of relentless corporeal evaluation. The capability for work questionnaire ESA claimants must complete includes, as well as a section, I must note this, as well as a section on, for broad descriptions of their illness and a section on mental health and cognitive ability, the following questions. I'm just gonna leave the questions there for you to kind of have a look at. Um, Um, what, what do these questions mean? Like, what then does the state require of a body to classify it as fit for labour? <laughs> Answers to these questions contribute to a point system which are compiled with claimants' point score at their face-to-face -face assessment. Assessors do not have to be medically trained to, uh, to, to ascertain what's, what the state requires of labouring bodies. These questions ascertain fitness to work. In such a perverse arena, the absence of bodies from But I'm Here for Mental Health counters the minutiae of claimants' physical encounter in, ESA, in the ESA process. Its absence from the film underscores the need to privilege the narrative life of the subject rather than the material body in ESA provision. In this context, arts projects function to support the agency of participants in challenging policy whilst also demonstrating an audience, demonstrating to an audience their own relationship to a network of precarious bodies. <coughs> so, uh, and this, again, it sort of relates to what Rhys was saying this morning, and it's gonna be a uh, kind of consideration of participation or exploration.
exploitation. So finally, in the current context of austerity, unpaid internships and underemployment proliferate, accompanied by a growing demand for claimants to work for their benefits. I propose that there is a need to reflect on participatory art projects potential as an aesthetic apparatus to sate public desire to bear witness to the unemployed body and the state of labour. The young unemployed body is conceptualised as inactive in policy rhetoric, yet it is consistently exploited in the workforce. Prior to the 2015 general election, both Labour and Conservative parties appropriate these inactive bodies to perform their hardline approach to welfare claimants. The Conservative victory resulting in the Earn or Learn task force headed by Matthew Hancock, uh, which introduced a policy from, or will introduce a policy from April 2016 of mandatory unpaid community work as soon as young people access benefits. Exploiting young workers is becoming commonplace. The, the Sutton Trust reporting in 2014 there are an estimated 22,000 unpaid interns in the UK, and this is a significant uh, underestimation of the true figure due to a paucity of information shared by companies engaged in these practices. The creative and cultural industries are particularly guilty of such exploitative labour practices. The Sutton Trust report finding that 63% of adverts on a specific intern site related to this particular area of work. As Nicholas Rideout suggests in his analysis of delegation and outsourcing, contemporary performance practice does more than reflect shifts in the operations of capital and labour. It participates actively in the logics of the service economy. And I want to build on Rideout's suggestion and propose this assertion can be extended to the exploitation of the welfare recipient's labour power. Arguably, the unemployed body engaged in acts of unpaid labour is a requirement of a participatory project. A particular consideration of engaging the unemployed in such activity refocuses the difficult ethical terrain of immaterial labour present in participatory art projects. On the one hand, it evidences the entrenchment of the arts in problematic labour practices, such as un internships and unpaid work, but on the other, it marks the radical biopolitical potential of participatory performance in engaging in other forms of value exchange beyond the financial. Uh, and One Million is particularly interesting for this. So, in producing One Million, Tangled Feet constructed a complex mixed economy of labour, which traversed the position of a number of different stakeholders. Primarily, there were the 80 young unemployed participants who Curry stated were paid a very small amount of money. It wasn't minimum wage, but it was just about going, you're here, and we witnessed that. So, these participants were joined by a number of employed labourers, 10 professional performers, and a further eight young people who were unemployed and undertook roles on the production team, such as assistant director, assistant sound engineer, and, and so on. These second two groups were paid professional rates in exchange for their labor, yet these contracted workers, despite being professionalized at that temporal juncture, were probably negotiating their own positions of precarity and underemployment. So the project operated as an employer, but also a trainer with both financial and experiential modes of remuneration being adopted depending on labourers' specific circumstances. The grand scale of performance required a turn to volunteerism, and in many ways one million could be subject to similar criti critiques of exploitation which have been levelled at Punch Drunk and Yumi Bum Bum Train as creators of large-scale immersive events via volunteers. However, importantly for the subject at hand, one million was free to attend and performed in public space. Following Rideout, I argue that placing those professionals and amateur bodies in the same public space problematizes the unequal division of labor in contemporary society, both in its content and in its very form. As Rideout suggests, these are moments when politics might break out, not so much because of an absence of work, of work or labor, but rather because of the terms upon which the theater is made. Uh, uh, because the terms upon which the theatre is made, unsettle our capacity to distinguish between work and non-work, process and praxis, the professional and the amateur. I contend then that the performance of One Million, whilst clearly being a product, was also a continuation of performative process, and engage an engagement of the audience in praxis as they moved around the space and interacted with the artistic event as it occurred. This clouding of distinctions between paid labour and participant was actively sought through the casting of the professional performers 
all in the 16 to 24 age bracket of youth unemployment. They were purpose purposely not distinguished from the participant performers. As Curry recounts, you don't know where the main cast ends and the participants start. So you might see someone doing something amazingly skillful on top of a bit of scaffolding, and you might think it's a young unemployed person, or it might be a professional gymnast. But because everyone's moving and it's immersive, you just don't know where the start and the end is. So the performance of these bodies then potentially undermines the whole structure of the labour market. Big claim, but I'm going to go with it. Um, as the employed are presented as indistinguishable from passionate amateurs. On the one hand, demonstrating their capability to enact labour, and so testify to their worth within the workforce, yet on the other, producing value outside the realm of the financial transaction, and so challenging the very foundations of the divisions of labour. It is here that we can see the radical potential of the performance of the unemployed body presented in tandem with the paid labourer. So with the activist group Disabled People Against Cuts recently triggering the UN inquiry into claims that welfare reforms are, quote, grave and systematic violations of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the relationship between, this, between state benefit and the body continues to be disputed. Participatory performers must position themselves with this, within this debate it has the capacity to engage with both Butler's acknowledgement of value in performing vulnerability, whilst also enacting Nolan's notion of embodied gesture as a mode to deviate from, the, from prescribed <coughs> superior norms. The medium of performance thus has the potential to promote bodily opposition and challenge cultural and social values inscribed on participants. Such an optimistic reading of the field, however, requires that companies are reflective and responsible in the labour practices they engage and uphold as employers. The particular position of unemployed communities provokes audience members to reflect on their own precarity as bodies and as labourers. Such projects ask that we recognise unemployed performers' potential futures and indeed ours.